Uh, you'll have to forgive me if I'm not used to being mic'd up, um, so I always have to project to the back of the room. I'm naturally loud, so if I blow your eardrums, just kind of say tone it down a little bit. Uh, I was talking to Mike earlier. I said I love your women's group name. It's the Christian Outreach Women's Study Cows. The fact that these uh, lovely women would take on the moniker of cow shows that Christian humility. It's that self-deprecating humor, which I really enjoy. Um, so I feel a little embarrassed if you're self-deprecating. I'm going to be a little self-indulgent today in this lesson. But I found, as like he said, I'm going to share what the Lord has put on my heart. I find that a lot of times when I tell you what I think the Lord wants you to know, it just kind of sounds preachy. Where if I share with you what the Lord is putting on my heart, what he's teaching me in my walk. A lot of times, someone out there is going through similar circumstances, has a similar question, they're like, wow, you can really learn from basically the mistakes I made. <laughs> so I fell in quicksand, I climbed out, I can tell you, we'll just walk around. It's a lot easier, a lot quicker. Um, so, to give you an idea, in this self indulgence I'll tell you who I am. You guys are probably wondering what's like, it's the phone, the camera, slides, what's all this technology doing invading our nice, humble, traditional church? Well, my philosophy is it's kind of futile to try to get the world into the church. Our job is to get the gospel of the church out into the world. So what I started about a year ago was the Back to Basics Berean Bible Study. Basis of the name is, as you can probably tell by looking at her, my wife works at a gym. The gym is called Back to Basics. We started the Bible study in the gym, like right on the gym floor, and the name so perfectly fit because that's the whole idea of what we're trying to do. We get back to the basics. First century church, house church, just disciples meeting together and doing exactly what they did in the book of Acts. So get back to the basics. Berean. Uh, my favorite verse, I like to challenge people. Acts 17, 11 says that the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they accepted everything with great enthusiasm that Paul had to say, but then they went back to the Word to confirm whether or not it was true. So that's why I usually challenge people. says, don't take my word for it. Like, I hope you don't believe me, and you go back and you look in the Word and you really research it for yourself because it's your personal relationship that really matters. I don't want you following me. I want, you, I want to direct you to follow him. Now, I was a little nervous whenever you present a message, but it was great that I got to sit in on the Bible study that preceded this, because I don't think it's really going to be a challenge. I think we're pretty much already on the same page, because it's a good tie-in from what I heard this morning. So give you another little background. This will be my last Sunday as a Pennsylvania resident. Next week, my wife and I are going to pack up our Jeep with as many clothes, books that we can fit, and we're headed down to Florida to start a complete new phase of life. Uh, don't have a home picked out. I don't have a job down there. I don't even have a specific ministry that I'm going to. Instead, I am simply responding. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> All right. Maybe church isn't ready for technology. <laughs> All right. All right. There we go. So I'm responding to the call that God gave to Abraham. He says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So bring the Lord here in prayer. I say, dear Heavenly Father, this is a rather weird and unique situation. So I ask that this not just be a fanciful whim that I have, but that it is indeed part of your divine, perfect plan. And more importantly, since you gave me this opportunity of being in a position to share your word with your people, I ask that you ensure I don't send them out on any crazy course of their own, but you keep me close to your word, sharing exactly the truth that you want them to hear. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Okay, now like I said, I'm going to give you a little of my background here just to give it context, but what we're really going to do today is explore what exactly the Bible means by faith. What does the Bible mean by that word belief? And I said I'm going to do my story, but realistically it's going to be a lot more Abraham's story. Because Abraham is, let's see what word is not, is the patriarch of all the Semitic people. Now if you listen to Paul, 
Even beyond that, he is the father of all who believe. So the entire church, the entire elect. And the writers of the New Testament reference Genesis 15, 6, four times. And Abraham believed the Lord, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Now this had a powerful personal impact on Martin Luther. It was the basis of his epiphany, and thus the basis of the entire Protestant Reformation. According to the story, Luther is studying the book of Romans, he comes across verse 117, which quotes Habakkuk 2.4. It says, For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So Luther says, wow. So you mean this righteousness that will get me to heaven, this righteousness by which I'll be saved, isn't any righteousness that I generate in myself? But it is a foreign and alien righteousness, specifically Christ's righteousness, which is imparted to me, imbued into me through the Holy Spirit. And it's at that point that Luther says, when I discovered this revelation, I was born again of the Holy Ghost, and the doors of paradise swung open, and I walked through. So, was Martin Luther correct? Yes. But, our Catholic friends will be very quick to point out that Luther added the word alone to faith. And the Bible clearly forbids us from adding to or taking away anything that the Lord has revealed, that the Lord has commanded in His Word. So, the next question, are the Catholics correct that Luther added something to Scripture that wasn't actually there? Yes and no. We're going to kind of go through this. What we need to do is put Luther in the context of his time. And understand that his theology was a reaction to, and maybe somewhat an overreaction to, the church in the 1500s. You see, by the 1500s, the Catholic church had basically devolved into a very ritualistic, very legalistic, ceremony and works based religion. It's very much like the Judaism had during Paul's day. The Catholicism of Luther's day had turned God into this deity who needed to be appeased through sacrifice, and through good works, and through all our own struggles and efforts. Now both Judaism of Paul's and the Catholicism of the Middle Ages lost this whole idea of God as a loving father who wants us to succeed. And because he wants us to succeed, he supplies us with everything we need to succeed in our walk of faith. Salvation is not something we can earn. It was supplied for us by that sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Faith isn't even something we can generate ourselves. Even our faith, which leads to salvation, is a gift from God. So, Luther was correct that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, all for the glory of God alone. Like Luther states that this one and firm rock, which we call the doctrine of justification, is the chief article of the whole Christian doctrine, which comprehends the understanding of all godliness. And we agree. The stumbling block, however, for Luther and the Protestants of that day, the stumbling block for the church today, and the stumbling block for the first century church as well, while the apostles were still actively writing their epistles, was what exactly is meant by faith. What does it mean to believe and be saved. So as I previously mentioned, Paul notes three times that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Now Paul was reacting to that ceremonial ritualism of his people. And like Luther, Paul also tends towards hyperbole at times to make his point. And if the verses that he 
puts in this like this, that antinomian Christians tend to deride a theology which emphasizes grace so much that not only do they completely abandon and ignore works, some go so far to even shun it and act like good works and, and being holy is somehow wrong. Um, but one doesn't need to leave the, even the epistles of Paul to find that proper balance between faith and works. In every single epistle where Paul demonstrates grace and explains that salvation is through grace, he immediately adds to that understanding that while we are saved by faith alone, it is a faith which is never alone. Paul constantly, in every epistle, emphasizes the holiness which will always be expected of true believers. Now take, for instance, we'll go with the probably favorite passage of most evangelicals that talks about grace alone. It says, Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. You probably have it memorized. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your doing, it is the gift of God, and not a result of works, so that no one can boast. Seems pretty obvious to everyone here. It's by grace, through faith, it's all free gift. But the thought doesn't end there. There's a verse which immediately follows. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So Luther's theology is a little hard to pin down because he is kind of all over the map at one time or another in his life. Um, but in addition to adding the word alone to faith, he's also notoriously known for attempting to remove the book of Hebrews, the book of James, which he called an epistle of straw, Jude and Revelation from the canon of Scripture because he perceived that those books somehow contradicted, conflicted with his concept of grace alone by faith alone. But for those of us who hold a proper understanding of salvation by grace through faith, there's no need to be afraid of James. James does not contradict Paul. They're both inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's impossible for the two to contradict each other. What James does is correct people's misunderstanding of Paul. If you read 1 Peter, Peter even notes that Paul's kind of hard to understand, and some people, and antinomians, those without the law, twist what he says to their own demise. And this is what he's talking about. So James makes this necessary correction to people's misinterpretation. What James does, he argues against this false dichotomy where you not only separate faith and works, but you actually seem to put them at odds each other as though they're enemies. Per James, once we fully understand, fully grasp that amazing sacrifice that Jesus made for us on Calvary, poured out His blood on our behalf, it will necessarily result in a complete change of our heart. It will result in a complete change of our walk. There's plenty of people out there and in here who believe in their mind that Christ died and rose again. I mean, they accept that historical fact of it. But that's not what the Bible means when it says believe in Christ and be saved. Believing in someone is completely different than just believing certain facts about someone. So let's go to James, let him do his own talk. James chapter 2. Says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Now, that's a theological question here. I've seen a lot of people who twist, mangle, and warp James chapter 2 so they can fit it into their theological box, but it doesn't work. You can't. If you just come to the scriptures with a plain, obvious reading, it is obvious that this is the question that James is about to answer. He says, what, um, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, 
Go in peace. Be warm and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with works. Faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by the works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So, when we take Paul and James together, which is how it's supposed to be read, we do not have a discrepancy or confusion as to whether we're saved by faith or we're saved by works. Rather, we have a clarification of what exactly is meant by faith. Like I said, believing in someone is completely different than believing certain facts about someone. It's not enough if we just acknowledge the fact that Jesus is the only begotten Son of the Father. That he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin. It's not enough if we openly affirm that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, he was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the abode of the dead, and on the third day that he rose again. It's still not enough, even if you are 100% positive in your mind that he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. The demons believe all that. I guarantee the demons know a whole lot more about theology than anyone in here. And they shudder in fear at the prospect of their eventual judgment. Yet, they're still not converted. Because biblical faith, biblical belief, is a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of the mind. Now, most Protestants agree that when we make Christianity all about works, that results in legalism. But they often fail to realize that when we make it only about believing certain doctrines, we're really not in any better place. Both extremes make Christianity a religion when what it was meant to be is a relationship. So in the context of a relationship, belief, means trust. Think of your own relationship with a spouse. Now imagine your wife telling you, yes, I believe in you, but then questioning everything that you say and never doing anything that you ask. Would you say that she believes in you? I dare not. A healthy relationship, a functional relationship, is one that because of a lifetime of experience of walking with you and living with you, she trusts your judgment because it's sound. She believes in you because she knows that every decision you make is always with her best interest in mind. And that is exactly the relationship that Jesus expects of his bride. If we say we believe in God, that means we believe that all he declares to be true is true. And all that he declares to be good is good. We don't need to be coerced in obedience for fear. That's legalism. <coughs> we obey because we love God. And we trust that he always commands what is in our best interest. That is a relationship. That is trust. That is belief. And that is faith. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. He was called a friend of God. 
Because when God said, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, Abraham went. And years later, when God told Abraham to sacrifice the child of the promise, he did. It was Abraham's faith which justified him before God. Don't deny that. But this is the type of faith which justified him. It's a type of faith which results in a complete abandonment of our own desires, a complete abandonment of our own plans, and instead completely trusting and embracing God's yet revealed plan for us. Now, Abraham was 75 when he left Haran. I'm only 47, but people still think it's kind of foolhardy and abrupt and it's kind of surprising that my wife and I would just pack up and move off to Florida without any real destination other than a state in mind. Um, well, I'm not quite as trusting as I'm making myself out to be. Let's give a little more background. Because you'll find that God in our lives will first whisper, and then he'll nudge, and then he'll shout, and if you still don't listen, then he'll push. So I've been a Christian for over a quarter of a century. And from the very beginning, when I was probably most on fire at a new conver conversion, I thought about going into the ministry. My plan was to go into ministry, but later. So I was a police officer at the time, uh, had a very successful career, detective in charge of CID, night command, SWAT, did the whole gamut, uh, rose to the ranks at an unusually fast pace, loved it, loved the job, didn't want to leave. Also, had family, tied up with family concerns, their sports, raising them, getting them off, doing their thing. So I was basically tied up, as Paul said, the distractions of this world. That's, that's the thing. So it was always, I'll do ministry, but later. So a few years ago, that nudge <coughs> became a shell. God basically said to me, is this real? Like a sign, basically, Cooper, get off the pot. Are you a disciple? I set out the Great Commission. You're all to go out to the world and preach. So I finally started to listen. Went back to school, got my degree, immediately transferred into the Masters of Divinity, got that, all with the intent of going back into the military as a chaplain. I was a Marine. Um, but said, but let me first reach full retirement. So I don't have to worry about funding my, my ministry. I'll be self-funded like Paul. And maybe I'll wait three years after that. I'll work a little further so I can even pad the nest more and have less concerns. So again, the Holy Spirit whispered. He nudged. He even shouted. Yet my response still remained, yes, Lord, later. So first I need to do such and such. Really? Now Jonah... He was a lot more honest than me. He didn't say, yes, Lord, later. He just flat out told the Lord, no way, Jesus. And he headed in the opposite direction. He ran away from Nineveh and headed to Tarsus. And we know what happened to him. Now, despite having no desire to be swallowed by a giant fish, I still continued to go towards Tarsus myself. So God needed to give me a little more motivation. So this year, I'm not going into the specific details, I'll just say he started removing one thing from another and another that ties me to the land of my father. Um, without the details, I'll give you an idea. It's 2019, you guys watch the news. I'm a command level police officer. Once you get to the command levels, it's not no longer about going out and locking up bad guys and, and Enforcing the law, it's politics. You are now in the political sphere. So imagine a old school law enforcement cop who's a born again, very outspoken, not shy Christian who speaks exactly the truth he sees when he thinks it's appropriate in a political environment which is very left wing, very politically correct, very secular, very worldly. You can imagine that basically I was a square peg in a round hole at that point. 
the job had moved on and my services were no longer needed. So I left. Two of my three children, successful jobs, got beautiful nice houses, they're gone. The third had a good job, serious girlfriend, so although he probably doesn't want to leave the house forever, it's obvious that it's going to happen pretty soon anyway. And then even my beloved dog died. So, and there's a couple other things that are a little more personal, so I won't get into it, but I kind of sort of feel like Job, where my faith's being tested, and each thing is being taken away. Taken away, taken away. So and then like, Jonah, I got to the point where I was afraid that I'd be walking around Cork Creek Park and a giant whale would jump out and swallow me. So, I had to go. And this is where faith comes in. Because I'm not happy about everything that I just shared. But I trust that God definitely has his reasons. Um, God has his plan, and his plans are beyond anything that I could imagine in my flawed and earthly human mind. So when God says, go from your country and your kindred, and your father's house to the land, I will show you. I'm going. He will count my faith as righteousness. Now, I'm not talking about any Joel Olstein type of nonsense here. Abraham made out pretty well when he got to his promised land. But there were certainly plenty of pitfalls between Haran and the promised land. I'm not expecting a land flowing with milk and honey. What I am expecting that at the end of this race, I will be able to say the same thing that his great-grandson Joseph said. And Joseph was betrayed by his brothers and saw injustice far worse than I ever had and probably ever will. But I, like him, at the end, I want to be able to say to those people who think they were the architects of my woes, I can inform them that, as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant for good. To bring about that many people should be saved as they are today. So, if you're still not convinced of the biblical definition of faith, and that it always results in action, we're going to go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. It says, Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. By faith, Abraham brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offering. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life, so he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken... He was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. And here's my part. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder was God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children, because she considered him faithful who had made a promise. And so, from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and as countless as the sand in the seashore. And I can see my wife, she looks nervous, she's like, wait, you didn't say anything about living in tents and me getting pregnant again. <laughs> but... All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. 
they've been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were not looking, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. It is by faith that Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. So Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. It is by faith that Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when his hand was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's eating. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt not fearing the king's anger, he persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And one more shall I say. I don't have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah. About David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what is promised, who shut the mouths of the lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced years in flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in the deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what was promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Uh, so, the entirety of Scripture is absolutely all about God's grace. It is all an instruction for us to completely put our faith in His grace. But it's never been a passive faith. Biblical faith is always a call to action. Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. Now, these Old Testament saints, they look forward to the salvation which would come one day. But we have a huge advantage over them because we have a witness as to how exactly that salvation manifested itself. We don't need to just believe in this idea of a coming Messiah. We are able to love Jesus the man. Jesus our Lord. Jesus our Savior. That's exactly what we do when we participate in the sacrament of communion. It's by faith that we partake of Christ's broken body 
He was broken for us. By consuming his flesh, we become a part of his mystical body. By drinking the wine, we partake of the blood which he spilled on the cross. His crimson blood washes us all wetter than snow. And it's by his blood we're healed. So like the thief on the cross that we all learned about last week, when we consume his flesh and blood, we are accepting by faith alone that he will remember us when he enters his Father's kingdom. And that he will honor that promise he makes to us today, that we will be with him in paradise. But unlike that thief, we have the rest of the week, nay, even the rest of our lives, to live out exactly what that promise means. 